to our Friday special conversations with special people. I am so happy to have as our guest today, a friend from the past, Louis Epstein, psychotherapist and family counselor. And Lou first spoke to our group on February 17th, 1994, <laughs> on the topic between fathers and sons. After that, he spoke regularly on topics ranging from family connections, the influence of fathers, wisdom of the ages, cultivating happiness, and a year, 10 years ago, on May 14th, 2011, on the topic, Seders and Last Suppers, and finding the deep meaning in our lives. Um, Lou and I, not only has he been wonderful, his mother, Molly, was wonderful. May she rest in peace. She lived at 110 votes and she was a regular at our library and she was so proud of her son. And um, that's, you know, like I say, we have a long history together. Since then, Lou moved out to one of the most beautiful cities <laughs> in the world, Tiburon, California. And as I told him, it is gorgeous. We went there, we went to the library. Um, I have to say, it's, it's just like paradise. It really is so beautiful. And I don't blame you for moving there as long as your whole family went there. <laughs> My family wasn't going to all move there. So that's why we're here. Sure. Um, today, it's, this topic is so timely. And um, especially at this time of the year with Easter and Passover, holidays and families and um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce a very dear friend to our, and to a, a dear friend to Beth, of course, head of children's <laughs> services, yeah. and also a good friend to all of us. Anyway, please let's give a warm welcome to Louis Epstein. Thank you so much, Phyllis, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Michael, for, uh, for technologically putting this together. Um, and yes, Phyllis, you know, the, the landmark that I remember also was 25 years ago, I had written a book on fatherhood and the library, the South Orange Public Library was the first place that I really gave a speech about it and it was recorded. And um, so it's the 25th anniversary of that <laughs> momentous occasion for me. Oh, and, right. um, and, and I also wanna say that, you know, my mother would felt so privileged in living next door to a library. You know, she was born in 1912 and what it meant to her to have a library next to where she lived was just uh, hard to describe how meaningful and how much, of course, I know she participated um, in activities. And so it's just, um, it has a long tradition and a wonderful one, uh, South Orange Public Library, and especially your relationship to all of these wonderful things that you convene, Phyllis, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, the topic itself is so fitting, here we are, just on the eve of three important holidays that come right in this season, Passover, Easter, and Ramadan. And it's so fascinating because, you know, they've been called the Abrahamic religions because they all have a relationship to Abraham. And it's uh, kind of a fascinating thing also when we have the topic of families hmm. and holidays that these are family holidays where it's not something that takes place just in a place of worship. They actually take place within the family and there are many choices to be made by family members about how they participate. So this is a fascinating kind of period, the spring, the opening up of things. And here we're coming out of a period when things were closed down for a year and how families navigated this complicated terrain of not being together for the many rituals that so enrich our lives. And beyond even holidays, there were funerals and things that could not be done under the conditions of COVID. Um, there were losses. And strangely enough, there were also gains that people found under these conditions of kind of being in a little bit of a cocoon and being mindful and meditative for those of us who had that privilege and opportunity just to be alone and to reflect on things. 
So this is such an, an important moment in the history of our country, in the history of world religion, because it so much is at stake in the world with the environment. And these are again, openings in spring, which has a lot to do with nature. So we have so many forces coming together. And uh, by the way, this is not a lecture in itself. So I really want you also all to think of this as a little bit of a town meeting, because I certainly don't possess all the knowledge that and wisdom <laughs> about families and holidays. We have a tremendous collective knowledge out there from people and wisdom around these topics. It's not something that anyone particular has the, I guess you could say the holy grail <laughs> about. So I just wanna welcome people. If you have a thought or a, or a question or an answer, uh, please feel free. I mean, it's a little hard with this Zoom uh, thing to, 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 to do that, but I'll certainly devote time at the end at least. But if you have a pressing thought or a question, please feel free and don't see this just as me lecturing because that's not the way this should be. This should be all of us participating in an experience that we come away with something more than that. Um, but one thing I want you to keep in mind through this is <clears throat> within the whole thing of holidays, I also want you to think about what I consider two life forces. One that goes towards individuality and the other force that goes towards togetherness. And these are, kind of, I feel, kind of universal forces that operate on all of nature. So we have a force within us that says, be like me. And it's kind of like the family as a group that wants togetherness and wants everyone to be the same and to observe the rituals. And that's one part of life. And then within that, there's that force towards individuality, which is, wait a minute, I'm a separate person from the family, the clan and the tribe. So how do we negotiate those two forces in our life, which will always be present? They're never going away. So as we talk about this, I want to, you to keep in mind how that fits in, these forces of togetherness and separateness or apartness in, in all of this. Um, because we all have need for both. We need connection and community and we need autonomy. And that comes out in these holidays too. Now, one, one question that even po we can pose on a very uh, basic level is why do we have holidays in the first place? Where did they evolve and how did they come into being? And there's no simple answer to that, but the way I look at history and, and the history of, of, the, of the human, <laughs> I think it would come back from, our, from very close to nature where um, we had cycles and seasons. And that's what we're still celebrating in many ways. We had um, planting and harvest. We have sun and rain and wind and soil, all these basic things. And before there was a science around it, there were gods, there was a polytheism. There were many different gods that people would worship for this magic and mystery that was all around them. And even the things that came along like the plague, the drought, the flood, it was all magic. It was all things that we couldn't understand, and in many ways, we still don't. <laughs> um, so, um, and then when holidays, when we got into different periods of civilization, when there were more feudal manners and kingdoms, and eventually nations came out of that, we have our own other rituals. We can call them the more secular rituals. And if you think about uh, the United States, well, What's our secular, I won't call it religion, but our secular rituals? Well, I guess they include Independence Day. And it's interesting, in Biden's speech, what he said is, you can all have a barbecue. Now, that's an interesting thing. That's part of our American ritual, fireworks and a barbecue. So people coming together, and he, that, that's an interesting, so there's our secular ritual. President's Day, Martin Luther King Day, Thanksgiving, New Year's Day, Valentine's Day, Labor Day. These are all 
family holidays in many ways that also have uh, another secular and even legal significance, days off. Um, but getting back to, 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 to the religious part of this, or I wouldn't say religion, but the more, um, the holidays that have to do with this Abrahamic tradition that I've been saying. Um, and, and the common part to me is that they all include certain things about liberation, um, a type of renewal or resurrection and revelation. And if you think of those different things like Exodus, resurrection, revelation, there, there, there's a lot of commonality there and things that we share, although these religions have often competed with each other and, and been at war with each other. And, and what I'd like to think about is that, again, even looking at this thing about separateness and togetherness, we can look at each of these, each of these um, religious ceremonies or, or family get-togethers or other things on a number of levels. Now, one level we could look about it is, let's call it the tribal level. And I know we're not in actual tribes, but tribal in the sense that when I think of the Haggadah, which is the book of, um, and it's, by the way, it varies very much and has no fixed thing but according to the Torah or the Bible. But the Haggadah um, often is a tribal kind of book. It has things many of, very often that says, what the Lord did for me when he delivered me from the land of Egypt. See, that's talking to the Jewish or the Hebrew people. But then that's only one level because then there's the individual level. Now we could say that if this is a if this is a holiday of liberation, then I guess as a free person who's no longer enslaved, in Egypt, how am I using my freedom? So there's the individual kind of we can call it existential question about um, this holiday, which has these different levels. And I would go beyond that and say there's a let's call it a spiritual or an archetypal or symbolic level which we can look at the idea of liberation as a more universal quality. Um, like for instance, um, the idea of the promised land. Well, okay, so that has a geographical context, but what about the idea of the promised land as something more symbolic? That if it's more universal, then I guess we all have some access to the promised land, call it nirvana, call it salvation call it a, a, a something that goes to a higher level of understanding or revelation even. So the idea that, that there are different levels of understanding. So if we just read the Old Testament, it's, it's a great book of stories. But if you look at it at other levels, it includes those ideas of tribal, individual, and spiritual. And I, I guess a lot of that is also true with other religions which I'm less familiar with. So if people at some point wanna give their own views of how that fits in, because I know within the Christian tradition, you know, the, the, the Christmas itself is, is a more, the date of Christmas is interesting. It's not as well understood historically, but Easter is very clear. Easter is a historical day and um, in the tribal part of Christianity, we could say the part that has to do with identifying as a Christian, as part of that group, you could say that that's the beginning of a lot of Christian history is after uh, the, cru the crucifixion of Jesus um, and the apostles after that. And it has a, a rich and long history of Christianity. But then there's the individual level of Easter. We could say, well, on the individual level, what's the meaning? of that? Well, well, it could be how do I embrace the, um, the forgiveness parts of it, love thy neighbor, all those th things that Jesus lived by and offered as a prophet of truth also. Um, and I guess the symbolic part of Christianity in that area would be the, the promise of salvation and eternal life. So going from, let's say, the Hebraic tradition of liberation 
as Exodus, here's one that says, here's this, this is for all time and for all humans to liberate themselves through belief in Jesus. And this is an interesting thing. So it, it still encompasses that. Now in the tradition of, of um, the Muslim tradition, which I'm less familiar with, but I'm interested if someone could also share with that. I know that um, the Ramadan is also the celebration of revelation of Allah to Muhammad. And so the period of fasting and, and the tradition that go with it are also about revelation. And I just wondered if someone might share at some point if they have that tradition and could talk about the different levels of that, both individual and um, and and the tribal, the individual, and the the, the 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 more symbolic or spiritual level of that. So, getting back to families and holidays, um, and that two forces that I was talking about earlier, the forces towards individuality and the force of togetherness. Um, I just wondered how it plays out in different peoples, the way they celebrate or the way they participate in, in these holidays. I'll share some things about how I do it or how my family does it, but I'm really interested in how other people telling how they do it within their traditions. Um, the traditions that we've, and this is the thing that's interesting about tradition. Tradition could be a very, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say dead thing, it's something that's not a living thing because it could just be something about the past. But how do we, and this is where that's the tribal again, but how do we make it more individual and perhaps if, if we're so uh, moved spiritual, like how do we take this thing which has tradition and, and how do we bring it into the realm of individual and perhaps something a higher level of understanding? And I think that's that, that there's no answer to this, but let me just say that I think there's a dynamic, um, there's no, no, neither of those things will win out. We're always living within that togetherness, separateness dynamic. So if we got rid of all traditions, we'd be in a kind of void. And you know, what's interesting about that is that I've worked with families as a therapist who were under ritualized. They didn't have enough rituals. Their birthdays weren't that important, holidays. And, you know, many of these couples and families thought they were pretty cool until when they had children, the children were demanding rituals. So children would say, the father would say, well, I, I never celebrated my birthday. And the kid's saying, well, why not? <laughs> it's your birthday. So the idea that we're part of a group, the group will put pressure on us around ritual. And yet within that, someone could say, well, gee, I want to be more of an individual. I don't want to do it that way. And so it's kind of fascinating how that plays out. I remember talking at an earlier library presentation about Tevye, the character from Fiddler on the Roof, the, the patriarch, the father figure, and how that entire play was about these warring forces of tradition um, and and the, 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 the need for people to be individuals and to figure out autonomously who they are. And if you well, think of it, hello? That makes me think of, yes. you know, next, a week from today is Good Friday. Yes. The crucifixion at Judas mm -hmm. who abandons Christ. Yes. So if you put that in the context of family, there are members of people's family who, who do abandon each other on holidays. Yes, yes, they do, they abandon. And it's interesting, the feelings and the human feeling about it is very similar over the ages. The word betrayal comes into this too, that, that we feel that we're meant to be, we're creatures of trust and hope. So that when someone uh, goes outside of that, they are often looked upon as betraying so, and someone could have an entirely different take on that and say, well, that's not a betrayal. That was his individual right. Um, and, you know, Beth, what you're talking about, when I think of Tevye, I also think of how um, he, his main song was about tradition, if you remember, tradition. Yeah, right. and, and that tradition was so important, but why was it so pressing? And why was it so meaningful? Well, because of the cohesiveness 
of the group, of the community in that little town. Because if they didn't have cohesiveness there, there were dangerous forces around. And I think that people and families and communities live with that fear that's multi-generational. It comes down the generations and historically. And so um, the Jewish tradition has a lot of fear around that. Now, Tevye was in the middle of an actual thing with the czar and the right. czar's forces. So the, the sense that his daughter would be with someone who was a non-Jewish person was a betrayal of the community and dangerous in his right. mind. So that's a fascinating part of looking at uh, the, the forces. Now, Lou, of Lou, Lou remembered Avalon when they Avalon. cut the turkey. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, they're there's waiting, some... and they get there, and mm -hmm. that family is torn apart. Remember Cut Turkey they before wait. we got here. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, the thing that's so interesting about it is that there's this symbolic aspect of that. Like, what did it mean to the family? I mean, I have things in my family too, where one of my uncles did not bring the milk or something he was supposed to buy to the uh, brothers. Um, <clears throat> One of Seder, it was some type of family affair, and they didn't talk for 20 years. <laughs> it had to do more than the milk. So uh, yes, there was some symbolic level going on, but the sense of the idea of individuality and, the, and what the group brings is such a force, and it so um, informs the therapy that I do, that the, the counseling that I do with people has so much to do with that idea of what did your family implant and what's the template out of which you're operating and um and then what how have you defined yourself within both that family and in the rest of your life so th those forces again and so when i think of uh, tevya being uh, eventually saying we can bend and but we shouldn't but something eventually breaks because it went too far out of the tradition and it felt like a threat to, to, to survival. And that's the way we often experience it. So, so the family Seder, if I were to have the one I was having with my family, with my grandparents' generation, they would have been, probably been horrified. They would say, what a betrayal of the thing. You're not even doing it in Hebrew. And it's like a, it would be considered what's in Jewish called a Shanda. <laughs> like a kind of a sin. Um, but, um, but to think about it's so interesting. So, so what we've evolved, and this is the interesting part of the individual, because change is often introduced unilaterally. So let's say one of my daughters uh, brings up and says, why don't we include this this year? And, uh, or someone says, well, that's something that I don't think fits in anymore. I'll give you a few examples before I want to open up uh, to some more discussion around this whole area of, um, of the two forces and how they play out in our families and in our holidays. Um, like one is, there's a, there's a I'll, I'll do it from the Seder tradition. Um, the new part, well, there's, a, there's an old part which, which the word Dayenu comes from. Uh, does anyone know what Dayenu means? It's, it's a song in, 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 as part of the Seder, but the word itself is fascinating because it, it actually means, if you translate it, 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 something like it would have been enough. Yeah. That's an interesting concept because, you know, enoughness is part of our spiritual tradition in almost every um, religion and spiritual tradition is that the idea that what we have is enough. And so uh, the Dayenu from the uh, Exodus and from the Seder has to do with, it would have been enough if God had just delivered us uh, or just parted the Red Sea and allowed us to, to uh, go into the Sinai, that would have been enough. But he not only did that, he fed us with manna. So he sustained us. And if he had only sustained us with manna, and not delivered us the, 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 the Torah or the Ten Commandments, Dayenu. So the Dayenu is the idea that there is, um, that that would have been enough. And yet we got even more. And it keeps going on. There's about 10 or 12 Dayenus in that. But what we've, what we've incorporated now, and it's become part of 
our, I guess you could say newer tradition introduced individually was um, the idea that we go around now and say our dianus. So the dianus are, well, it would have been enough if uh, I just moved to Tiburon, but uh, now I have my family surrounding me here too and my grandchildren, dianu. It would have been enough. And so uh, I think my in-law introduced something called the trianu. <laughs> There's a third thing, but the, the idea of dianu and, and updating it, it needed an update because it wasn't just about what so-called God did for my tribe 5,000 years ago or 3,000. So um, another one is, you know, there's a, there's a part where in the Seder where uh, we take our wine and we take a drop out for each of the plagues and the plagues, the ancient plagues are um, blood, frogs, gnats, flies, cattle disease, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and the slaying of the firstborn. So those are the plagues of ancient Egypt that were visited upon the Pharaoh when he would not let my people go. <laughs> so someone in the family introduced the idea of, well, instead of those ancient plagues, what about modern plagues? Are there things in our lives that feel like plagues that are just so um, antithetical to, to life and, and pleasure and fun? And we came up with some interesting things. Like we go around the table now and people say, uh, one year I said screens, you know, these, these computer screens were becoming a plague or- um, oh, Remember I, my, Lou, one year oh, mine was go ahead. The, the little TV, this is years ago. I spent yeah. many, many Passovers with the Epstein's that I miss it terribly. But yeah. when I went to Pathmark and when you got to the register, there was a little TV on. Uh-huh, yes. Remember that? I thought, why do I have to watch TV with ads? Well, I'm trying to check that to me was awful. That was interfering with a quiet moment of just yes. Yes. Being with myself. Yes, so the play. It was interfering, it was really interfering. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, there have been plagues and so interesting that we're coming out of an actual plague, which, you know, we, we actually, it also challenges those notions, this current COVID plague, challenges our notions also of individuality and togetherness. Just think of the kind of unfortunate politicization of the whole process. Wasn't it all about togetherness and individuality? This time individuality, for some pe people meaning, I don't have to follow that rule which could be seen as a virtue or as a, as a statement of, of, of differentiation and defining oneself. On the other hand, here's a time when the tribal and the togetherness forces had to do with survival. If we all pull together as a nation or as a, as a community, then we survive. So look at those forces again in, in the current plague. <laughs> and it, it's kind of a fascinating element to all of these things. Um, yeah, just a couple more, and then I'll, I'm certainly interested in other people's, how they're dealing with tradition and innovation. Um, the other one that we continued was something called chametz, and that's the burning of the bread. Now, we don't burn the bread, actually. In very religious communities, they actually, before Passover, they'll burn bread because it's all going to be matzah for the next eight days. So the burning of the bread is symbolic, but what is chametz? It's kind of has to do with things that have yeast in them. And what does yeast do? It puffs things up. So the burning of the chametz, let's get, get, get back from the tribal level to the individual level, the existential level is when we're burning the chametz, like we symbolically burn something at our seders, we burn, we, we, we all write something on a piece of paper, something where we were too puffed up that year. We were too egotistical. We were too self-involved. That's our hummets on the individual and symbolic level. So when we burn that, just like yeast, we're burning that out and we're symbolically saying, may I not be so puffed up this year, so, so much, so, so self-absorbed. Um, and um, just a number of other ones. I mean, uh, another thing that we changed was instead of the four children 
which is there are four children in the um, tradition of the most satyrs, which is the evil child and the child who's ignorant and the child who's this, and they look like bad children. And we started to think, well, children aren't usually bad by nature. So instead we have the four adults now. And the four adults <laughs> are people who are plagued by anger and um, selfishness and different things like that. So, uh, you know, and um, even the idea of the four cups of wine, because remember these religions were all patriarchal. So the people that got to lean back on pillows in the tradition of the Seder were men, not women. So th th there's so much patriarchy in, in many of these religions and, and certainly the Abrahamic religions. So now the four cups of wine, uh, my daughter just introduced that there are four women as part of the history, as part of the, the history of the Exodus that are under appreciated, you could say, under-recognized. Uh, like the first cup of wine is now done, will be done in this Seder for Shifra and Pua. Now they're midwives who refused Pharaoh's order to kill any, born, any boys born to an Israelite family. And these midwives risked their lives to help save the Israelites from destruction and genocide. It was an act of civil disobedience, an early act. So there's an honoring of women. Another one, the second, the second cup of wine honors Yacheved, was the mother of Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. Gets very little play in most satyrs. But um, she also, when Moses was born, she hid him from the Egyptians and their, what you could say, their genocidal orders. And so um, she placed him in a basket to send him down the Nile, leaving his fate in God's hands. Um, but she made the impossible choice to do whatever might be necessary to give her child a chance of life. The third cup of wine, Batya. Batya is Pharaoh's daughter. She understood that he was an Israelite baby whose life, that was Moses, was in danger. And she resolved to adopt him despite the risk it might carry if her father learned of Moses' origins. So Betya used her privilege and position to have impact that she could. So she took risks with the privilege that she had. And Miriam, who a, is a kind of more central figure, that's the fourth cup of wine, is now gonna be honored in her. Uh, she, con she actually convinced her older parents who were exhausted and traumatized by slavery to conceive Moses. So Miriam influenced a lot. She was just a very brave person throughout the whole thing. As a matter of fact, she led the women and children, the backbone of Jewish life safely to shore across the Red Sea, dancing and singing. So she was considered a prophet also. So I'm just saying that there's the, the new and the old. Like if we can introduce the role of women, important women into the Seder, then it challenges some of the tradition, which was the patriarchy. So it's all kind of an interesting mix of social things that we challenge and using our individuality to put forth and introduce a new idea into a tradition. So I'm, I'm very interested to hear how other, I mean, I'm kind of don't want to go on with only the thing what I do in my Seder, but I'm interested how other people might take Easter or Ramadan and bring, have brought in something new or in a Seder that somebody decided this is tradition and this is the new. Would anyone like to share something? Well, this is about a Seder. Okay. In our family, which- what, Who is this? What's your name? Myra. Oh, thank you. Nice In our you. family, um, we weren't terribly observant growing up, my husband and I, but when we had children, we wanted them to have the tradition and um, so what became part of our tradition 
was to say what we were thankful for, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily related to the holiday itself, but it became something that everyone looked forward to saying at each each year. Yes, yes. And, and the thing is interesting how that so that became a family ritual and one that people participated and looked forward to. And I also had wondered, as you might have, like whether people would want to do that. And you know, some people might not want to. And everybody seems to look forward to it because it's participatory. It's That's not exactly. just somebody else's um, again tradition. Anybody else have things that they've incorporated or maybe something that they would like to even bring into as a new tradition? No? Okay, well. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, ask you, I'll ask you something. Go ahead, go ahead. The traditions that we follow like you, mm -hmm. but um, during the pandemic, mm -hmm. a Hasidic group, when they get together for an, and they have, where does government and religion step together or apart? And in what role do you think that plays? Yeah, isn't that a fascinating one? Because we have here again, the secular and the religious, and we have a country that was formed on the basis of religious freedom. I mean, all these groups that came from Europe, many of them, they were seeking, I'm sure, economic uh, liberties and other things, but what were they coming to? These various um, were outlawed or um, religious groups and sects that were outcasts, often in Europe. And um, so, if they, so if that's one of the basis for the foundation and the forming of America or the United States, then you could see how strong the idea of religious freedom would be that we're not gonna interfere with that. Obviously the first amendment includes that. Congress shall make no laws uh, about religion. So there's that foundational principle and here then it comes into contact, Phyllis, with a, with a secular thing and, and history, of course, we can't take things out of history. So here we have history and science telling us that under certain conditions, there's danger in being a group or being part of a group that congregates in a larger form. Right. And, <clears throat> and it's such an interesting basic conflict. If someone, is highly religious in the sense of the belief in a divine power, then often they would be in conflict with science. They would actually say, well, I am willing to put myself in that condition because I believe um, that God wills things and therefore I have the right to exercise my free expression of religion. And here it comes into contact and conflict with the secular state, which says, no, you don't because you're endangering the lives of the larger community, the polis. And that's yeah. such a fascinating and ongoing, <clears throat> but maybe it's the same thing we're talking about is that there's a, there's a realistic and meaningful tension between these two forces again, you know, that the state has certain powers because it's there to protect the majority rather than, and if it's using science, it seems like it has a valid thing. And then you're going to get someone who's more fundamental in their beliefs and say, no, that doesn't fit in with my, with what I believe. And you cannot, uh, and of course, you know, we have all the possible solutions of people living apart and being a community um, apart from others, but that's less possible under the current conditions and the way that the country and other parts of the world are configured, because we know that also all is one, that what we do so affects each other. So this is an interesting uh, conflict. And um, I think some of that was resolved or at least understood that, that they could nuance that, that they could provide an idea where people could meet 
in a congregation, but they would have to really socially distance and that Congress should not make a general law. It was too harsh to say you couldn't meet at all. And that was the kind of compromise I think they arrived at in New York State. But it is a fascinating uh, ongoing dilemma. And I, I'm, I'm no longer thinking of those things as, you know, problems that we can't resolve or they're so thorny, but really um, understandable things to be embraced in the best way of understanding that it respects difference, yet still tries to protect us. It's a real, it's thorny at times. It's a very political thing. It, it is, it is. <laughs> Depending on where people sure, live. Sure, sure, sure. And the tension isn't necessarily, what I'm getting to is the tension isn't necessarily a bad tension. It's a understandable outgrowth of, of difference. Right. Which goes back into a very much our sense of the, the polarizations that occur in families and in larger society. And the demonization that can also go along with that. So yeah, it's... It's ongoing. Is there I anyone have, else? Yeah. Oh. If, does anyone else have a question? I want to see. No. I have Father Frazil from Seton Hall, a wonderful man. And uh, he was telling us statistic wise, people are not, the younger people are not being as religious and are in any religion and he's talking about when in other words they're doing their own thing yes and and uh, do you have anything to say about that i do i think that i mean i think what engages people just like going back to the theme that we're talking about about you know these holidays and traditions and individuals coming in with a different idea I think these, these things, it's the same tension there that I think it requires a convocation or meetings with people to bring in, how does this all fit together? I mean, how would, how would you engage younger people in something that's spiritual and less a part of what's traditional organized religion, which is a meeting in a church often or temple where people are reciting prayers and listening to sermons. Maybe the format needs to change and the message from young people is that this doesn't really connect with me anymore. I need something that embodies something that's more participatory perhaps, that has a different way of including me. Because I would feel that myself when I would go to services uh, temple services, and they just didn't seem engaging. Um, and so, the idea well, in, of, in, yeah. in Catholicism, you know, when every Sunday, Mass is the gospel reading, and yeah. you sit there and you listen to the gospel. And I would always wish, okay, the priest is not married, he doesn't have children. So, right there, I'm thinking, this is not somebody that I really feel I can relate to. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, look at your community and try to, what you're saying, reach out to people and find out what is going on in their minds, what they're thinking about, what they want to hear from the pulpit. Yes. It's yeah. not a strict retelling of the gospel that you just read. And that really has, has turned me off, yeah. It, it has. I mean, I think when I tr talk with people in therapy about uh, their spiritual life, because many of them have a wish for that, and some of their psychological things seem very connected to growth on some other level, um, their associations with that are organized religion. Right. There's an arrogance. There's an arrogance attached to it. Somebody yes. standing. There's an arrogance yes. feel, and you, mm -hmm. a disconnect. Yeah, okay, not, not every not every parish, but I don't know, pretty much. Yeah, well, the, the thing about these these large meetings where people pray and, and sometimes the sing together and they have a wonderful place in the tradition. But sometimes I would feel like, you know, after attending various religious uh, 
masses or different, um, whatever the meetings were, I would think about, gee, I wish we they break down into small groups, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was my wish. And if we could take the theme and people could connect it to their own lives and see how does this relate to me or is there a meaning in this? Just like we're talking about the Seder or it could be a family dinner around Easter and it could have a new meaning and then everyone connects again with it. Because if we want things to be included in the future, it has to have meaning to the people involved. I think my daughters have carried on the traditions that they chose within the Jewish religion, partly because it had rituals that were meaningful and uh, changeable, that it was well, inclusive. Right. Well, I, I will say that going to church different, like this, this Sunday's Palm Sunday, there's so many rituals around that mm -hmm. and Holy Week. So going to church then, growing up, you know, that was like my life was Catholic school, Catholic, everything mm -hmm. was related to the church and the parish. So those feel familiar and comforting. The music, you know, I think that is something mm -hmm. that comforts people, most people. Yes. Sit in a place and sing a hymn and look around and know the people are singing with you. But yeah. is that enough? Is that enough? <laughs> well, that's that's a good question. You know, to get it back to word Dianu, maybe it's not. It's and not maybe, enough. <laughs> maybe it's not enough because that, um, you know, our whole humanity. I remember once attending uh, a Quaker meeting and I once attended a Quaker wedding. And it was so fascinating to me that the Quaker tradition is one in which people would stand up when they were so moved and say something at this wedding that moved them or inspired them to speak and everyone would listen. And, um, you know, there was concern, well, would, gee, would it be silent? And the silent was, silence was also accepted. But the idea of it kind of a faith in human participation when it's not pressured and it's kind of just there to be taken and beholden. And, and that's what I noticed. And it was kind of fascinating to see that it's both a ritual, but it has newness right in it because it's right in the moment where people are being inspired to say something or put forth something that they're experiencing. So I think that Quaker tradition is kind of fascinating to me. And maybe that's what we're incorporating in part when we have people speak out about their own experience, their own thankfulness, their own dianus. It's like it's bringing it right into the present moment. Don't you think that the traveling of people moving on away from their tribe or whether or their families mm -hmm. has also changed um the course of religion because when people used to live close to their families whether they liked it or not they went <laughs> yeah no that's so true that, that's that what, um, yeah that's what i'm talking about judas you know says, no i'm bad i'm one of your apostles your family but i'm gonna actually do worse than abandon you you know i'm gonna uh, <laughs> Betray you, yeah. Betray well, the thing, you. Thing, but I think that's what we go back to. I think a family feels betrayed. Like you sit down at the, ta at the big table and you look around and you're like, where's so-and-so? What? They, they didn't, didn't come. Want, they didn't want to come this year? Why? Oh, you know, they can't go to a soccer game? Like, well, aren't we more yeah. important? You, yes, you definitely feel betrayed. Yes, no, I think that that issue of betrayal throughout the thing, and often it does come from tradition, like this is what we're supposed to do. It happened many times, um, going back to my family's early history, when they had migrated from parts of Russia to the Lower East Side of Manhattan, um, they, they took with them some really interesting folk things and things from their towns in Berdichev and Pinsk in Russia. And um, I think what would happen is when they're in the next generation, their sons or daughters, my uncles, uh, started living in America. It was no longer considered cool <laughs> or, a or a good adjustment to the new society to, to continue those rituals. And it was definitely felt this betrayal in part by, um, by that generation. Um, but the family part, Phyllis, that you were speaking about was that without 
other entertainments, the pre-television, pre-even radio, when they were first there, they would walk across the bridge, which I believe was the Manhattan Bridge from Brooklyn, because there were some people living in Brooklyn and some in Manhattan, and that was part of the ritual of a Friday, of a Sabbath, or other times where the, the family, that's what they had was each other, the dinner, the meal together. Yeah. And so that was what was the entertainment, the life and everything was all in family gathering. So when people started moving out and away and it didn't have to be far to be considered either a betrayal or where did you move? Like when my family, my parents moved from Brooklyn to a part of Queens, which was on the border of NASA called Bayside, it was really looked upon by the family, like, where did they go? Well, because it was 1950. So it was also like moving into a little bit of, it was more farmland and, you know, less built up, but it seemed like such an outlandish thing to do. And it My kind of- My thought I betrayed her moving to New Jersey. My grandma. Yes, yes. So there's she plenty of what? betrayals. She did. <laughs> yeah. We all stay together. Yes. She said, how am I going to get to know Annie if you live in New Jersey? <laughs> you know, it's interesting also with that, <laughs> right, right, is that if, and this is the truth that comes out of therapy too about this togetherness and individuality thing. If the person or even the group that does it maintains their position and says, this is what I stand for, this is what I believe, this is what I think is right for my family, um, after a few months usually, the rest of the family or the larger group adapts to that and adjusts to it and even respects it. It's only when we get highly reactive and get into these back and forths around it that it often deteriorates. So the idea of this forces of togetherness and individuality, if an individual holds his or her ground and says, this is where I stand and they're not gonna fight about it and they're going to say, this is meaningful to me, very often the group adjust to that and not only adjust, but comes to a higher level of functioning after that. And I've seen that so many times in working with families that um, when, when a person uh, takes an individual position that is strong and they mean it and they're not willing to get into big dramas around it, the family sometimes actually grows from that and, and all boats rise and go to a higher level. So I've seen that many, many times. And that's the force of individuality, which it's not just challenging the tradition, but is saying I'm different and I'm still connected. Right, and, so and, what's, it, the most it, it, and what's the most important thing? Not that we're right, but that we're together, right? Well, I kind of, it balances that's, both. That's I think it. what it does, Beth, it balances both. It says I, I can be both an individual right. and I'm gonna right. be, be together. And I, I've seen it play out so many times. I know that I just wanna give an example from a therapy that my that a colleague of mine, famous now, and had done a lot of work on this, she worked with a woman, a young woman, who in her family, her, um, her father was an alcoholic. And she was always in charge of him and picking him up from the bar when he got drunk. And that was her role when she was a teenager and she could first drive. And when she had children, she just felt that it was something, first of all, she didn't want to do, but it was outmoded. And she just decided that she was no longer going to do that. However, the group or the, 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 the tribe said to her, you can't do that. That's your job. You, you, huh? that, you, were, you were assigned <laughs> to that early in life. And you know, what do you, if you don't pick up your father, what's going to happen? He's going to, he could drive drunk home. You don't want to do that. You don't want that on your shoulders so look at the bind she was in between the tribe yeah. and her individual uh wish for autonomy so what she did one day when her mother said your father's at the bar and he's drunk will you please pick him up she said she didn't say no but she called the police oh now, this was a violation of the tribe in the greatest sense oh, that so, was terrible. So, so she called the police it looked terrible but you know, when the family came back to her and they all condemned her for calling the police, she said, look, I couldn't leave my children. I wasn't going out and I wasn't right. gonna let him die in a car crash. So right. you decide, you made the decision too. It wasn't just mine. 
and it was interesting. And after that, they, after condemning her and, <laughs> you know, and, and calling her an outlaw and everything, well, she held her ground and the family eventually came up with other solutions and things around it. So there's that for those two forces again. Neither of them are, are 100% right. Maybe. Did you, the, oh, what, no. What's that? Nope. Oh, so the Sorry. force of individuality um, and that point was a very strong one and needed to uh, prevail. But anyway, it, it's, it's always there with us. And I think these holidays are a, a good time for us to continue to reflect on, the, on these forces that we're always a part of. So. Mm -hmm. Lydia, I have something, some, uh, a piece of information. My cousin lives um, on Reading Court, Tiburon. Oh, really? I know Reading, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's so nice. You know you? where Reading Court is? They, they yes. live on top of, yeah. I've so if you're, in the, sure. if you're in the, uh, I spent the, a weekend there once. If you're in the bathroom, there's, it's all glass, but nobody could see in. But you could <laughs> see out across the bay. Oh, there's, yeah. It's fascinating, yeah, the, yeah. Those views of the bay are really just mm. wonderful. And uh, yeah, she, she was a cardiologist and her husband was a pilot. Uh-huh. No wow, kids. Well, I could say that this is such a nice place to retire to and uh, yeah, yeah. live in. And um, yeah. it's been just a pleasure being here. And talk about the forces of togetherness. I mean, I, I'm here because of my children and grandchildren. So oh. the idea that I'm lucky to have um, a family in which none of them are being moved around by a corporate structure. You know, they can choose to stay where they are is a, is, a, yeah. is a dayenu. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have two children in California, oh. along with my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. um, and we never, we never made the move because there were health issues with my husband that mm. prevented that. But I was interested in seeing how, what, how, what would develop uh, with tradition because our family was not, uh, we didn't go to synagogue. We certainly identified as Jewish, but, and did, but we, my two sons each married, mm -hmm. uh, someone who was traditional mm. and now my sons both have become part of that and it's so interesting to me and I'm glad about it because I feel a little derelict mm -hmm. <laughs> and and um, so I will be spending Passover on two Zooms or, or maybe one Zoom with both of them. And that's why I felt, I said before that Zooms have saved me because uh, it's, it's just a way to connect and we're getting hopefully closer to being together in person. Yes, yes. And that uh, so good that the technology offers us that opportunity to connect because I also would have felt terribly, terribly isolated if I couldn't even uh, see my grandchildren, which was a possibility at some points. And so I also found the internet and Zooming and other forms of virtual connection were life-saving in that way. Um, so I found that also. And I just want to say how the, those forces of like seeing, and you don't have to feel derelict about the non-involvement because we go through periods of life when we're just not experiencing that as important to us. And it's so interesting how children often bring us back and grandchildren into that because there is some desire in them for some types of rituals and even religion of some form. Uh, it's fascinating to me how sometimes children will introduce that and also connect to other families that, that we haven't even thought about, people, other family members. When I've done work with children, I've often done little what's called genograms, family diagrams, and they were very excited by it often and would talk about distant cousins in different parts of the country, which I felt was, that's, that's so interesting. The parents weren't as interested, but the children seem to have an almost innate interest in staying connected to people that they 
believed and thought of, and thought of as their family. So there's something very, um, I would say, is innate about that wish for 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 network and connection. connection. And so children embody that and ritual too. Well, you were wonderful, Lou. Thank you. I wish well, you I... and your family a happy and a healthy Thank pace. Off. I wish everyone happy holiday, happy, good Easter, good Passover. Yes. Uh, yes. Will, Ramadan. Will be... Ramadan is a tough, uh, they, they can eat from certain time to a certain time. Yes. Can, I, can I add one thing about Ramadan? And I only, you know, we have our beloved Aisha and Fuzan. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. And sure. one year Fuzan said to me, you know, people think of Ramadan that it's about deprivation. And it, it is not about deprivation, that there are other aspects to this that are not well known to people. I certainly don't want to talk about them, but I think that that's a, just a good thing to think about, that it's not sacrificing it's about sort of coming closer to god yes yes, yes. and think about that that we, our opinions and associations and what we don't know about other cultures and religion right. is right. so right. unfortunate yeah. because it, it colors it a certain way yes and i'm sure as you're saying beth there's a lot of joy in that and it is a family thing where the family are making little decisions around it and sharing in a thing, even if it involves a certain amount of deprivation, it's being done with the group. Right. Oh, group. It, and the meals are always shared, and, you know, yeah. and down and yeah. But sure. yeah, Fuzan was very frustrated by that and felt, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, that people just made a judgment. Yes, yes. And I don't want to say anything more because I don't know enough, but I do remember having that conversation with her. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, sure. We need to know more about this Scottish tradition. Since next Friday is is Good Friday, will mm -hmm. will there be a, a a one of these meetings? No, we're having it on Saturday. A Good Friday. Uh, we're not having this, but we're having the speaker, um, uh, Paul Oster, who wrote mm -hmm. four three two one. So we thought April third. 21 he'll be fascinating and i hope you'll join us at two o'clock next saturday so thank you all for coming yes. oh, thank, thank you, you. Lou, well you'll say that wonderful okay. thank you thank usual. you and it, thank and you. it was a pleasure I and i and i wish you all one. the best good health and happiness to all yes. of you Bye -bye. and marion is marion there no well marion must have left I just wanted to wish her, uh, she worked with us for many years.